that's kind of how it started going. And before you know it, I aged out of uh, Anaheim Kingsman and somehow got asked to teach at Santa Clara. So tell us about that, because... Oh, man. That, that's, that's hooking up with the guy you were admiring yeah. across town, <clears throat> seeing Santa Clara, or across the street, rather, seeing yeah. and hearing Santa Clara doing things you were admiring oh. at a high level. We had so much admiration for that cool because that that core because they had this. We were kind of wild and we played funky stuff, and Santa Clara was like more classical oriented, so it was just a different vibe. But Fred Sanford's writing was just unbelievable. Him and um, like Larry McCormick that did the Cavaliers. I mean, those guys were my idols in terms of writing special stuff. And some of the guys that did Blessed Sacrament, Golden Knights back in the day, and mm -hmm. Boston Crusaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know I used to listen to all that stuff on records all the time and pound it away. And so that's where I got a lot of my influence of uh, of uh, writing for drum corps, along with just growing up and uh, with classical music. And so I, th I thought that there was always a place in my heart to be able to do something like Santa Clara, and I got asked to go over there. And and uh, before you know it, I'm working with Fred. And again, you know, it was like the first chart I got was to write. Gail Royer says, well, we're doing this. So I'm saying to myself, well, you know, we'll just do what we always do. You know, we put the record on of the original. And, we get some ideas, and then we just like adopt it for drum corps. So Gail goes, we're playing this. And then we went to Appalachian Spring. I didn't even know what, whatever, I didn't care. So I go to put the record on, I'm listening for drum parts. Time's going by and there's no drum parts. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden there was boom, ba dum boom, boom, boom. Wow, drum parts, like a couple of timpani notes. Yeah. So that's when the realization came to me, like, okay, you're going to have to do this or you're not going to last a second. So I was really put on the spot. You know, I didn't have my usual tools that we had. This was stuff that I had to really, like, compose. Uh, so that's where Fred came into play in his style of writing, and I had had it down in my mind. You know, I admired it so much. His and um, again, you know, Larry McCormick's with the Cavaliers back in the '60s, early '70s, mm -hmm. and th those guys had a little special thing going. It was a little different, and I was very attracted to it. So it was really those guys and Fred and listening to them, and uh, that was a strong influence on. Besides growing up with classical on what Santa Clara did, so I just kind of made myself fit. So, um, I think people often are, are interested in the fact that you have a very diverse musical palette. You have a very diverse musical vocabulary. Mm. You're, you're uh, inspired by lots of music. Um, and that's because you grew up, obviously, listening to a lot of music. Everything. That, that gave you a sensibility, I guess. So, mm -hmm. so as, as, you're, as I'm listening to you tell me this story, because it's the first time I'm hearing this, and you're saying, okay, I'm... I, I'm, I'm working on Appalachian Spring. I'm used to a formula where I get to listen to drum parts and make them work. There are no drum parts. W what di did you realize? You just had to let it, let your intuition settle in and start to apply musical well, yeah. concepts that, that were I was just I was forced. Yeah, you know, uh, it was like I don't want to say shit, but or get off the pot. You but, can, but that's. Yeah. really what it, what it was. <laughs> so when did you realize, so tell us about the first, so I, I think anyone who's probably listening to this who's been an arranger, we've, we've all gone through that experience of writing your first chart and, and that feeling about it, mm -hmm. the whole process, and then the feeling of having it played and hearing it and the worry or the, combined with excitement. Tell us a little bit about, so, you know, here's your, here's your first writing effort with Santa Clara and, 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 Talk a little bit about that. I hated everything I wrote. Every single bit of it my first year. I just, because it didn't sound, it sounded like an attempt to, to be like Fred's music. And I learned something from, from, from that. I mean, a lot of people liked it. I, I, I had done my thing as somebody coming in and 
replacing Fred and like still had a little something going on to be recognized. But personally, it just wasn't holding a candle. And um, <clears throat> that's when I learned. I remember going to Gail Royer and him and I were up on a roof of a school, you know, doing ensemble rehearsal with the core. And I was listening and I turned to Gail and I says, you know what? I don't like anything that I wrote. This sucks. And he goes, you know, you're right. It absolutely does <laughs> suck. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, it's enough when I, I can get on my case, but, you know, you, like, agreeing with, with me so hardcore. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't. I felt like, all right, now that I've actually gotten this stuff out, I, there's, I, my next time around has got to be really hot. I mean, we still wound up taking third in percussion. Mm -hmm. That year, the core was established already, just like the Anaheim Kingsmen. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll tell you something interesting about it. Uh, the first thing I actually brought to Santa Clara, because I was stu studying Edgar Varese then, and the famous piece, Ionization. Mm. And so, I did this arrangement for marching percussion of Ionization, just little chunks of it, for the drum line. And I remember passing it out, and everybody's going, what? But Alan Christensen, who's um, <clears throat> he's a famous DCI just now and fabulous educator, he was my lead snare then. He was the last of the famous guys, you know, in the line, and he thought it was cool. You know, and I went, oh, okay, some, you know, justification here. He goes, yeah. oh, wow, but it was kind of weird. We never really played it, but I had a chance to write it out and, and uh, pre present it. And so I felt like we're, I was on the same page and I'm introducing ideas, kind of the same club that you guys are in. Not like I was trying to be that, but I figured that's what it was. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way I perceived it and now I was right. This is, uh, then I got into the name of Vanguard, which meant for, forerunners, leaders, mm. and this and that. And I kind of thought that that's what Pete and Gail and all those guys thought. That's why they named the group that, that they started. Uh, whether that was true or not, I never checked, but so I just went for it. It was my own little personal motivation to keep coming up with something fresh for the activity. You know, and like, to be honest with you, you know, it was, it was kind of scary because I was a straight up homeboy from the ghetto, Los Angeles. Deep. And my folks said, you know, you need to get out of here somehow and go do some stuff so you can figure out what was going on. Uh, and so I, I did, you know, and I never really looked back until maybe 10 or 15 years ago when I started making comparisons of where I came from and what I've achieved in our activity. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunities. The doors opened up at certain times, and I went through to see what was on the other side. And talking about luck, because nobody knew who I was. I was the black guy that played in the Kingsman snare line. <laughs> total hippie hood guy back in the Haight-Ashbury days. If you've seen some of the old pictures I have, I, let, I had like shell bling, you know, those shell gas station shells. I had a big shell, man, with like puka shells and stuff all, you know, it was my necklace of it, you know, and I'm, you know, I got a little... You don't mind if we post a few of those. Oh, photos. I don't yeah, care yeah. about that. Those are, <laughs> those are around, you know, like and sandals and a big nappy afro all warped off to the side like Gumby. <laughs> You know, because I couldn't afford to go to a barber to get it all shaped up like Michael Jackson's and all of those guys. But, you know, I just, I was pretty strange back then, and I just went with it and come to find out uh, I haven't changed. I'm still strange. But I like myself, so. Yeah, and a lot of people love you, man. <laughs>